Mojo, I'm going to go for the heartstrings of the Penn audience. Buzz said the best game he had ever been to was Harvard Yale in 1968. I have a different one. Penn Harvard, November 13th, 1982. I was a sophomore. The football team had been terrible for years. Here it is, third down and 15. The watch. <laughs> we'll get there. I was a sophomore. The football team had been terrible for years. They were two and 27 the three previous seasons. They hadn't won an Ivy League title since 1959. Franklin Field was an icon, but and Franklin Field was an icon that was built when Penn was a football powerhouse. But the bricks and mortar were literally crumbling. There were there was no reason to go to games, and nobody did. But second-year coach, Jerry Burnt, fall of 1982. Penn shuts out Dartmouth in its opener, keeps winning. The NFL players were on strike at the time. Villanova didn't have a football team. Temple was terrible. Penn was the only game in town. And the Eagles' flagship radio station, WIP, started covering games. And as the winds mounted, fans came. Almost 35,000 showed up to the Harvard game at Franklin Field. The teams were both 4-1. and one. The winner would clinch at least a tie for the Ivy title. I was sitting not in the press box because on the staff of the Daily Pennsylvanian, I was a news weenie, not a sports weenie, as we were known, um, but in the upper deck where with other undergraduates, I threw toast over the railing during the singing of the line, here's a toast to dear old Penn in the school song, Drink a Highball. I'll sing that on another show. I've sung school fight songs on this podcast before, but none from Penn, oddly enough. 13 minutes to go in the game, Penn is up 20 nothing. Harvard scores three touchdowns to go ahead 21-20. A little over a minute to play. Penn has the ball on its own 20-yard line. The offense loses ground on two plays. Then senior quarterback Gary Vera completes an 18-yard pass under heavy pressure. And here is the call, now legendary among Penn fans, from Merrill Reese of WIP. Here it is, third down and 15. The wide receivers are split. The backs are on the eye. Play action as Vera retreats. Vera's looking. He's being chased. Still looking, fires, a diving reception made by Rich Sirak across the 30 with a first down at the 32. Rich Sirak out of no place. And shaken up on the play is Gary Vura. Vura was shaken up. He was hit hard as he released the football. All right, Vera comes out for one play. His backup throws the ball out of bounds. I talked to Vera yesterday, and he said he, he, said he felt foggy after the hit. And while no one in football would have called it that in 1982, he had a concussion, and he admitted that he, had, he might have had a concussion. But he goes back in on the next play. It took everything in my power to remember the play and execute it, he told me. 24 seconds to go. His next pass bounces off of one receiver and into the hands of another. Penn zone, immaculate reception. Ball is on the Harvard 48. 17 seconds left. Vera rolls left, completes a pass to the 32. 10 seconds left. He rolls right and finds a receiver open on a flare route. He runs the ball to the 21 and out of bounds. Three seconds to go, a 38-yard field goal attempt for the junior kicker, David Shulman. David Shulman is going to come onto the field and try the biggest kick of his life. Three seconds remaining. The ball will be spotted at the 28-yard line. It's spotted. The kick is away. All right, Shulman had made two field goals earlier in the game, but at the other end of the stadium, which is the closed part of Franklin Field, Franklin Field's a horseshoe, the wind always blew in fiercely and still does from the open end, and it's partially open actually because the athletic department runs from sideline to sideline, um, which is, I love that about Franklin Field. This day was really bad, cold, windy. Shulman was kicking from the right hash mark. He duck hooked the first kick far, far late. It was like three, you know, three goal posts width wide left. Now, no matter what anyone from Harvard says, including San Francisco columnist Gwen Knapp, who covered the game for the Harvard Crimson that day, Shulman was roughed. I talked to him yesterday, too, and he denied embellishing, though you can see after the Harvard player knocks him to the ground, Shulman rolls over and grabs his knee a couple of times. <laughs> I knew something had happened, he said. I just knew it couldn't end this way. If it did, I would have transferred. <laughs> 
Half the distance to the goal on the penalty. 27 yards, second chance for Shulman. Here it is, ladies and gentlemen. And Windsor loses it right here. Here it is. The ball is spotted. The kick is away. It's long enough. It's good. Penn wins. Penn wins. Penn wins the Ivy League title. Penn wins the Ivy League title. They don't believe it. Penn wins the Ivy League title. Penn wins the Ivy League title. Yeah, Merrill Reese did not believe it. <laughs> I didn't know it happened. I actually was at, I was at that game that day. And you know what? I'll tell you, I was. And I was popping those extends like crazy. <laughs> and it still didn't work. You know what? I didn't need extends that day. No, I did. It was, right. ama- <laughs> was an amazing game. It was absolutely amazing. Let me finish. It was. All right, so Shulman's first reaction, and our, our listeners can't see this, but we can. Is Shulman's first reaction was to pick up his little kicking block which was allowed in college football, which I find, as a kicker, really funny. Vera, who was his holder, and Shulman wind up face mask to face mask at the bottom of a big dog pile. Vera starts shouting, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Tell him to get off me. The fans poured onto the field. I was among them, tore down the goalposts, carried them out of the stadium, down the long block, and dumped them into the Schuylkill River. (laughs) I can, to this day, without looking it up, recite the lead of my friend Dave Zelezny's front page story in the Daily Pennsylvanian. On the verge of making history, the Pennsylvania Quakers made time stand still. The headline on the sports page was, Call It a Miracle on 33rd Street. As a side note, I had one of the uh, two non-game story bylines on page one the following Monday. Uh, it was about uh, it was about the, uh, a tuition fight against the university. It hit, was, it, hit leaders pro- Decry pro- postponed meeting. <laughs> I, thought, <laughs> I thought it meant, might have been an environmental story. School, <laughs> Schuylkill River contaminated with goalpost. No, I wait. So I, meeting, I, I remember that too because you threw it in, and I think fifty-five bodies rose to the surface. <laughs> so the meeting was postponed. If it was canceled, they would have had to go with the World War One uh, font <laughs> on the front page. <laughs> The game actually got a lot of attention. Sports Illustrated covered it. Uh, the cover of that issue is the one with boxer Ray Boom Boom Mancini landing the punch that killed Dooku Kim. Penn goes to Cornell the following week for the season finale and anticlimax loses 23 to nothing. The Quakers wind up sharing the Ivy title with Harvard, which beat Yale and Dartmouth too. But the kick and the season changed the course of football and sports at Penn. Three years earlier, Penn had reached the final four in basketball. The economics of higher education, recruiting, all made competing in that sport impossible at the highest levels. Penn soon became known as much as a football school as a basketball school. As for the principles of the drive and the kick, Shulman never kicked after Penn. He spent 25 years on Wall Street. He rose as high as managing director of the, and, uh, and head of global fixed income at the Swiss-owned UBS. He left in 2008, though, during investigations into trading practices at the firm during, during the financial meltdown that year. In 2010, Shulman agreed to pay $2.7 million, $2.75 million to settle insider trading claims filed by the New York State Attorney General's office involving the market for auction rate securities. He told me that he's moved on from the episode. He said he's had an otherwise, he had an otherwise unblemished career and is still working in finance. Two of his four children are at Penn. He keeps the kicking block and his cleats from the Harvard game in his office at home. He didn't consider it insider trading. He refers to it as kicking off the tee. <laughs> yes. yes. You know, it's, it's just another heartwarming Penn story. God bless those Wharton guys. They really do. 
the quarterback, Gary Vera, graduated from Penn after that season, which means he was part of the uh, quarterback class of 1983. Black, <laughs> Black lad, Jason, Vera, yeah. <laughs> he, was, he wasn't drafted like the other guys, but he was signed by the Eagles, lasted through the end of training camp. He was third behind Ron Jaworski and Joe Pizarczyk. Uh, he did not, though, get to play in a preseason game. And after he was cut, he started his own Wall Street career, all of it in bond sales trading. He was at Penn last week to attend a teammate's induction ceremony into the Penn Sports Hall of Fame. I asked Vera if he was in the Penn Sports Hall of Fame, and he said, I guess I need one, more than one drive. <laughs> Vera said he still sees Shulman a couple of times a year. Every November 13th at 4.21 p.m., the time of the kick, they usually remember to send each other an email. The 30th anniversary of the Penn-Harvard game is this fall. Vera hopes that Penn holds some sort of commemoration. His idea, maybe we can get the goalposts out of the Schuylkill or something. 